Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Mohamed Moti from the Sorbonne University and Saint Antoine Hospital in Paris. Uh, and it is my great pleasure and honor to be with you uh, today as part of this fantastic masterclass. And uh, uh, I'm very grateful uh, for the invitation. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, MPE for really their hard work uh, for the benefit of uh, myeloma patients uh, in Europe and across the globe. So for uh, this morning, I've been asked to give you a sort of a summary snapshot about the new development and controversies in uh, the treatment of multiple myeloma. And as you may guess, this is really a very broad title. Uh, we can spend days and weeks actually uh, looking into the new developments in multiple myeloma because every day you have something new, uh, especially that as you probably a few weeks ago, we had the ASCO and EHA meetings, and there has been some fantastic uh, uh, novel uh, information uh, during these congresses. So I do apologize that I will not be able to cover everything, but I will give you a sort of a snapshot about what I feel are the most important things that would be practice changing. My disclosures are shown here. So what I wanted to highlight exactly is how these novel data are going to impact the management uh, of uh, patients with myeloma from a daily clinical practice. So the idea is really to be focused on the practical uh, aspects. And by the way, I wanted to highlight that we have, for, for this purpose, you can refer uh, to the EHA ESMO clinical practice guidelines that were published uh, three or four months ago, uh, and they are very clear, very nice, and uh, they should serve as a good reference. As it is usually the tradition, we uh, divide usually uh, research in multiple myeloma about transplant eligible, elderly non-transplant eligible, and relapse setting. And I will follow this same uh, structure and highlight what do we know in the transplant eligible patient. Well, first of all, uh, I think autologous stem cell transplantation in multiple myeloma is here to stay. We have today the long-term uh, follow-up results from different randomized trials. One of them is the IFM 2009 trial showing that after seven or eight years of follow-up, there is a clear advantage in favor of autotransplant compared to the best regimen you can use without transplant, for instance, uh, VRD, bortezomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone. So a very important message, transplant is standard of care. So this is, uh, for me, uh, not a big issue. So if you want to perform transplant, you need uh, to start with an induction regimen. And actually, the induction field has been moving very rapidly. And while for almost 15 years, uh, we've been living with triplet inductions, uh, VCD, VTD, VRD, bortezomib cyclophosphamide dexamethasone, bortezomib thalidomide dexamethasone, or even bortezomib lenalidomide dexamethasone. Actually, now we are moving to quadruplet uh, induction regimens by adding an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies. And for this now, we have the approval of DARA-VTD, Daratumumab, Bortezomib, Thalidomide, Dexamethasone, thanks to the Cassiope trial. But also we have the randomized phase uh, two trial, Griffin, published in blood and updated recently, showing that Daratumumab VRD, Bortezomib, Lenalidomide, Dexamethasone, is also a very good induction regimen, especially when it comes to inducing a very uh, deep level of uh, MRD negativity. So clearly, major advanced practice changing, moving to quadruplet induction regimens. Induction, high-dose melphalan, what is the role of post-transplant treatment? Any role for consolidation, for instance? 
So should we deliver a couple of uh, cycles after transplant to further deepen the response? And I think the advance we have, and this is why it is a recommendation, I think, in Europe in general, based on the European Myeloma Network data, that two cycles of consolidation can translate into long-term benefit. I know uh, this has been a bit controversial, especially in North America, where consolidation is not always used, but definitely from a European perspective, based on our randomized trials, uh, consolidation is uh, recommended. Next is the issue of maintenance. Uh, we all know that lenalidomide uh, maintenance is really the standard uh, of care after transplantation in multiple myeloma patients. And the question is, can we do better than uh, lenalidomide alone? And here we have emerging data suggesting that a doublet maintenance using two drugs for maintenance can be useful. And this is also based on some European data. This is the Italian 40 randomized trial presented several times by Dr. Francesca Gay, showing, for instance, that carfizumab plus lenalidomide maintenance is clearly improving the outcome of these patients. Of course, carfizumab is IV. This is not very convenient, but you have trials now testing exazomib plus lenalidomide, full oral combination, or daratumumab uh, subcute plus lenalidomide. So in the transplant eligible population, if you look to the overall recommendation from EHA ESMO, uh, all young and fit patients should be able to receive an autotransplant for induction. The recommendation is about VRD or quadruplet plus daratumumab. For uh, post-transplant treatment, for the time being, lenalidomide uh, maintenance is a standard of care. So it is becoming uh, very well structured and you can see the field is really uh, moving and all of these changes are translating into improved uh, outcome of these patients. Let me move now to the non-transplant uh, eligible uh, population. And you know very well that uh, the majority of multiple myeloma patients are non-transplant eligible because of age, but also frailty. I think the biggest and really major advance in this population is about uh, this combination tested in the so-called Maya trial, combining daratumumab, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, and compared to lenalidomide, dexamethasone. Uh, this trial has been published and updated and there is a clear progression-free survival advantage in favor of Daryl and Dex. And the good news we have just heard a couple of weeks ago at EHA, this is the later breaking abstract, is that there is an overall survival advantage. And this is very unique, I think, to show an overall survival advantage. So, uh, and here we're talking probably about a median PFS of five years, which is very unique. Remember, all our uh, treatments in the elderly population were around 30 to 35 months median PFS. Now we're almost doubling this, plus an overall survival advantage, which means by using the best combinations from the beginning, you're not inducing more resistance. So clearly, practice changing the use of daratumumab and aldomide dexamethasone in the elderly population is becoming the standard of care. And this is true and recommended because actually these uh, combinations based on uh, daratumumab, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, but also other combinations are able to induce a high level of MRD negativity, up to 30% of these patients. And definitely MRD negativity is translating 
into improved outcome, especially when it comes to sustained MRD negativity. So if you have a sustained MRD negativity, these patients are really going to enjoy a better outcome. This is why you can see here the EHA-ESMO guidelines clearly recommending DARA-RD first as a, a combination in the elderly, but we have also other options. For the sake of time, I will not go into these details. And as I mentioned in my introduction, I'm really focusing on the most important highlights from my point of view. Let's move now uh, to the relapse refractory uh, group of uh, patients. And actually, uh, these patients, uh, a majority of these patients are going to become lenalidomide free. I have just uh, discussed this in the transplant eligible patient. We're using lenalidomide maintenance continuously. So at time of relapse, they become lenalidomide resistant. But also in the elderly population, as I have just highlighted, if everybody is receiving Daryl index, well, at some point, you become resistant to lenalidomide. So what are the treatment options we have in uh, these uh, uh, patients? Well, let me start first by the image-free options. Well, this is about combining, actually, a second-generation proteasome inhibitor plus an antibody, an anti-CD38 antibody, like daratumumab. In the CANDOR trial, uh, daratumumab, carfizumab, dexamethasone, and this has been now uh, published and updated. There is a clear advantage in this population of lenalidomide-resistant patient in favor of the triplet combination with daratumumab, carfizumab, dexamethasone. We have exactly a similar story in the IKEMA trial with isatuximab, carfizumib, dexamethasone. And you can appreciate here the very high level of MRD negativity. So we have in hand very nice and effective options in those patients who are lenalidomide refractory. But of course, not every myeloma patient can receive, for instance, carfizumib uh, because of the uh, cardiovascular risk. So you would like also to have options avoiding carfizumib. And this is where you can introduce other emits like pomalidomide. Pomal and uh, pomalidomide is oral, so very convenient for patient. Uh, especially in a COVID-19 pandemic, for instance, uh, and uh, highly effective and safe. And this is what we have seen in the ICARIA uh, uh, trial, uh, looking into isatuximab, another anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody, plus pomalidomide and dexamethasone. And this triplet combination is highly uh, effective in the patient who are lenalidomide refractory. We have also the Apollo uh, trial, which actually used pomalidomide dexamethasone plus daratumumab. And this trial has been presented at the ASH meeting, but actually it was just published, I think, three or four weeks ago on the 2nd of June, if I remember well, in the Lancet Oncology. Uh, by Dr. Dimopoulos and colleagues. And you can see that it is uh, highly effective in the lenalidomide refractory patients. So very good option, especially if you are using daratumumab sub-Q for, for the patient, it is very uh, convenient. But I can tell you because the, the topic is about the innovations, you know, the advances. I believe uh, this story will continue for the next two or three years because we are now having the new generation of emids. We call them now cell mode. Uh, this is about iberdomide. And iberdomide is rapidly coming in the field. And we'll have the opportunity, I'm sure, to discuss it uh, later at some point. And these different options that I've, I have summarized are already uh, incorporated, included in uh, the EHA-ESMO uh, guidelines. And I will not go, of course, into these details. Last part of my talk about all of these advances in the field of multiple myeloma is about the immune therapeutic options. 
for many, many years, we didn't have uh, immune therapy in multiple myeloma. Thanks to the introduction of antibodies, anti-CD38, we started having our first immune acting agent. But now you will see we do have cellular immune therapy uh, and bispecific antibodies T-cell engagers. The bispecific antibodies are really a clear breakthrough in hematology. And in myeloma, uh, I could see over the last 12 months that seven or eight different bispecific antibodies uh, are uh, being uh, uh, tested in different clinical trials. One of them is this one, the teclistamab, which has received uh, a few days or a few weeks ago uh, a breakthrough, uh, I would say, um, consideration by regulatory agencies because of the very high and very deep level of response that can be achieved in heavily pretreated patients with a good safety profile. And the story of bispecific antibodies and T-cell engagement is very interesting because instead of manipulating the cells, as we will see in the CAR T-cells, actually you are giving an antibody that can, on one hand, I would say target the CD3 T-cells, but also then bring it to the uh, tumor cells. So very attractive, very uh, refined mechanism of action. But also we have now bispecific antibodies targeting different antigens. Teclistamab was against BCMA, but now we know that it's always better to have different antigens. And we have, for instance, talketamab, which also uh, the data have been presented at the last ASCO and EHA meetings one month ago, targeting GPR-C5D, again, with a very, very uh, high level of response and very uh, good improvement in heavily pretreated patients. If we're talking about immune therapy, of course, I can't skip the CAR T cells. And the CAR T cells are moving really very nicely in the right direction. And I believe now uh, we have in hand two uh, key CAR T cell constructs. One of them is this one, uh, Silta cell. Uh, and Silta cell is uh, quite uh, uh, amazing in terms of result. And we've seen this update uh, again one month ago at the EHA and ASCO meeting, showing in heavily pretreated patient more than 20 months PFS, median of six lines of prior therapies. And you have, uh, of course, uh, 20 months. This is very unique. And the safety profile is rather good. So I think uh, this CAR T cell, the Silta cell construct, will make it rapidly uh, into the uh, routine practice. It is not yet approved. The product that is approved for the time being is the ID cell. And this has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, five or six months ago. And you can appreciate very good results in a very large uh, single arm study, heavily pretreated patient, patient who failed uh, anti-CD38 antibodies, uh, protism inhibitors, uh, emits, but the response rate more than 80%. And we have a very nice, decent progression-free survival, overall survival. These patients are supposed to be in uh, you know, supportive care because you have failed all the previous options. So CAR T cells are providing a lot of hope. And when you look to their safety, in contrast to the CAR T cells in lymphoma or acute lymphoblastic leukemia, actually the safety profile is rather uh, good in CAR T cells in multiple myeloma. Because they were not approved uh, uh, already at time of publications of the EHA-ESMO guidelines, they are not included here, but you will see now we do have really a large uh, variety of regimens and products uh, to uh, tackle to treat these uh, uh, relapse refractory multiple myeloma patients. And this is really good news because we will be able more and more to uh, refine and to personalize 
the uh, treatment choice, the treatment combinations to fulfill, to fit the needs of every individual patient. And I think this is really the greatest advance and uh, I'm very uh, grateful uh, to all the myeloma community, but also to the patients and their families for their uh, great involvement in the clinical trials, in the research effort. Thanks to you, actually, uh, we are able to advance uh, this field. So with this, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And of course, uh, at some point, I'll be more than happy to take questions or comments uh, uh, if needed. Thank you very much.